for field trips uh, coming up, uh, you want to check uh, to be sure. Check our uh, check our website. But we have uh, coming up in uh, March very shortly. This weekend, uh, March nine, is a visit to the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, which will uh, not only look at the Louvre but will highlight some of the architectural uh, highlights. Uh, and uh, uh, March twenty four will be a hike into the uh, hinterland of Ras al Khaimah near to Hatta, uh, looking at an old copper smelting uh, site. Uh, and then the end of the month will be a uh, Dow trip to the Masandam, uh, which will require, that's gonna be a little more expensive because it's overnight and using a boat and it will require an advance uh, payment. So please do think about that. If you wanna go make a, make a decision. Uh, trips coming up, we have uh, first week of April is a trip to the uh, uh, Greek uh, Peloponnese. Uh, it's a repeat of an earlier trip, but this is based on historical. But my notes here say it's full and closed. So if you maybe if you pray, it will open up and you can get a spot. Uh, and then uh, uh, mid June will be a trip to uh, uh, to Slovenia. Uh, it, it, it has there's an easy version and a harder hiking version as well. Uh, we haven't done quite as well uh, locally, but uh, coming up, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, nature walks, a visit to the newly opened uh, uh, Hindu temple in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, and another uh, Damaniat uh, Island uh, boat trip. The last was very successful with camping on Damaniat. We're also looking at visits to Wadi Mariah, uh, SeaWorld, Atlantis, and the Jumeirah uh, Turtle Rehabilitation Project. And, but it remains to be seen whether those, uh, whether and how those will go during, uh, <clears throat> during uh, Ramadan and uh, after. Fortunately, uh, the weather will still be uh, <clears throat> decent in April and some of those can go ahead. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing from uh, uh, Professor John Burke of NYU. I've, uh, many, many of you will know, and others I, I spoke to this evening, uh, John has a, a history in the Emirates that goes back more than uh, 20 years. He, he uh, taught here as a junior uh, uh, faculty and then uh, uh, went off and got his, uh, got his PhD and came back with, uh, with NYU. And uh, those of you who heard him lecture uh, a year ago, at uh, more or less a year ago at Inter-Emirates Weekend, uh, will know that he's involved in what is really cutting edge work uh, on the marine side uh, in connection with corals. Uh, uh, he'll probably say something about this, but I think he's gonna try to avoid corals, which he's lectured on specifically. Uh, in short, the, uh, the coral reefs in the Arabian Gulf can withstand higher temperatures than any other coral reefs on earth and studying uh, how they, who does it and how they do it uh, may give us some insights into what can be done to help other corals worldwide that are having trouble with uh, increasing temperatures. Uh, that's not what John is going to talk about. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say this, that he has always, he's, he's very busy if you read his, uh, his uh, uh, bio in the Gazelle, you'll see that he's not only teaching courses, but that he's also a member of uh, a number of uh, interdisciplinary groups, uh, which means whether, whether or not he gets, gets to study and do science, he has to sit at lots of committee meetings and uh, so on, which uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly takes up a lot of his time. He's, uh, he's, he's always had time for the natural history groups. He, he was a member when he lived in Dubai uh, uh, long ago. He may still be a member. I didn't check the membership list. Tonight, uh, he's, he's, under, uh, he's under some special uh, pressure because we're catching him in the middle of returning a, a sailboat from a race. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't race, but he's returning one of the sailboats from, uh, from Muscat to uh, the Arabian Gulf. Uh, they were caught by bad weather, so the boat's in Fujairah, but John is here to, uh, to speak to us uh, uh, tonight. And I'm going to let him uh, mostly speak for himself, except to say that 
he he made the uh, the uh, possibly uh, career smart personal stupid uh, decision a few years ago that he would uh, become the editor of a a book surveying the uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, what we what we uh, know uh, from research over the last uh, 20 years, adding to the 30 years of local research. Uh, and he was going to edit a book with uh, 20 plus authors and keep them all in line and get the book out on time and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> that was uh, one of the, uh, the, the kickoff for that was December of 2021. Uh, and we had online, online presentations from uh, lots of different to people in lots of different fields. The result uh, was now a few years later, the, the book that you see here come in, you can hold up a copy. It is 700 pages, but they're not coffee table pages. So you can, uh, you know, you can actually take it, take it to bed with you. And uh, stop. put your put your head on it when you <laughs> when you're when you're finished reading. Uh, these are also available uh, for sale here tonight. But I, I don't want to I don't want to hide the ball. This book was also uh, uh, by design. Uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, the authorities in Abu Dhabi. The it was the, the NYU's local uh, partner uh, sponsored the book to be a totally open access book. So you can go online. Uh, in the Gazelle, we've we've printed the uh, uh, the links uh, for those of you who can use links. I, I you know, uh, and you can you can read, download individual chapters. You can read or download the whole thing. If you read everything in the book, you will be very very well informed about natural history and so on in the in the Emirates. Uh, you will also be a lot older when you <laughs> when you finish. Anyway, John is going to uh, give us tonight some uh, 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 potpourri uh, of uh, interesting uh, material that's uh, that's in the book. Uh, hopefully some of you uh, some of you will uh, want to buy some copies, but that's not the main the main point. The main point is, to hear what's going on, maybe get interested yourself. And those of you who have a history with with the group, know that uh, it's still it's still possible uh, for you to add to the uh, information and understanding that we already have. With that, I'll turn the floor over to John uh, John Burt. Apologies to to you in the room and anybody at home that can hear me for uh, the delay. Uh, the we we still haven't got the uh, all the IT connections down quite as well as we uh, uh, we would like to have. Thank you. Um, so I am not going to go through all 748 pages tonight, don't worry, but we are getting started 20 minutes late, so please forgive me, those of you at home and those in the room, if we run over the nine o'clock curfew, which I think we may. Um, so this really should be called a celebration of the natural history of the Emirates, because that's what this book is for me. Uh, it was sort of, as Gary alluded to, a bit of a yoke around my neck for a couple of years. Uh, I had grand dreams at the beginning of it, but we ended up with a remarkable product that I think you'll all enjoy. Uh, for those of you at home, this book is available either through the link you can purchase hard copies, which get delivered to your house for free. Um, or you can pick it up at your local Magrudis as soft copy or hard copy. Uh, the ones I have here in the room are 200 dirhams, uh, which is the, a discount from what they're selling out on the market for the hard copy. And uh, what I'm going to do in the very last slide of the presentation is put a QR code up there so you can access it on your phone, send yourself the link by email or whatever, and you can get every single page that's in this book for free. Um, so I never read hard copy books, but I know there are uh, the people at the home won't be able to see me very <laughs> um, uh, so uh, uh, you can read every single page of this book for free uh, on your tablet when you go to bed or on your laptop at work, etc. And of course, my clicker won't work. All right, here we go. Uh, so many of you recognize that the UAE has experienced exceptional growth, uh, both in its population and economy since its federation in 1971. 
Uh, we've had rapid development and expansion of trade, uh, industry, tourism, and so on. Uh, that's basically put the UAE on a central stage. Um, so it's become a global hub uh, for both cultural exchange and business, but really there's not as much awareness and appreciation for the natural environment that we have around the Emirates, which is really astounding. When you think about the unique ecosystems and the diverse flora and fauna that we have here in the UAE, these really are natural assets for this young nation. And uh, part of the program that I had in mind was putting together this tome of work that you have available to you here today, both for your own personal uh, use, but if any of you are in education, this is something that's written towards the general public intentionally uh, as sort of a, a, a reference material for anyone to be able to access. And it, I should point out it has over 450 color images uh, in it as well. So it really is a remarkable, and every single picture that I'm using in here today um, has come from that book. Just a little bit on, on this is something that is not knowledge being developed in this area. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of the specimens that were being collected were being put in places like the British Natural History Museum. Um, and so we had no real uh, sort of homegrown knowledge. Now, of course, the Emiratis that were here do have an oral tradition carrying on a lot of this environmental knowledge. But of course, it's not written, so we don't have records of that. Uh, we saw a shift basically after the discovery of oil, when people started becoming resident here rather than visitors. And so many of the early people that were involved in natural history were actually from the oil and gas industry. So this person here, Kinsman, for example, is a geologist who was actually looking at coral reefs in Western Abu Dhabi and described them as the world's most thermally tolerant corals years before we were talking about climate change. And so this, this sort of um, increase in knowledge that's going on locally started to expand quite rapidly as sort of the, the economy and the population grew here. And we had the formation of the Emirates Natural History Group. It started off with things like the Gazelle. We had uh, earlier on the UAE University forming and so on. And we're starting to get other chapters in the Natural History Group growing as our population continues to expand. So we went from Abu Dhabi where it started to here in Dubai, later Al Ain and so on. Um, and while we have at that time a very rapid growth in the amount of natural history knowledge that's going on in the UAE, this has been largely led by amateurs. Okay, so yes, that fellow Kinsman was a professional geologist, but he's working on things like coral reefs. We have people like Gary, who is a lawyer by training, uh, who's published probably more than I have <laughs> in his career. Kinsman was one of my teachers as an undergraduate. There we go. Kinsman was his teacher. So long connections. And uh, what we started to see in the late 1990s and early 2000s was as the economy matured here, you started to get more and more academics <laughs> and researchers who were in that field. And to this date, I would estimate that probably 85 or 90% of the natural history knowledge in the UAE is coming from amateur naturalists rather than professionals. And so we're starting to get in there, but we're building on a very strong foundation that's already been led uh, by, by these uh, very passionate amateurs who have been leading the, the, the fray. Sorry, I lost my clearance. And we still continue to make discoveries uh, to this day. So this is a vessel called Ocean Explorer that is run by Ocean X. Uh, Dalio Philanthropy, so Dalio, Mark Dal or sorry, Ray Dalio is the largest hedge fund uh, operator in the world. One of his passions is the marine environment. And I had the pleasure of being on this boat for about two weeks in December. Dive, that's me on the left-hand side, diving down in the submarine to work on what are called mesophotic coral reefs uh, here on the east coast of the UAE. Uh, so I got to dive down to almost a kilometer depth. Uh, this is me working on this area here where you can actually see we have mangrove roots uh, that are... Um, uh, down at depths of about 125 to 200 meters depth in this uh, old river valley that was there during the last ice age. 
long gone now. We have coral reefs that occur at 150 meters depth and even deeper that we didn't even know existed two years ago. And I was the first person to actually set eyes on these. So we've discovered whole new suites of species there as well as genera of species, large valleys, submerged valleys that are off of our shoreline. Um, and we got to see, I'm just gonna skip ahead on this video to save time. Uh, see this little monster here for the first time in the UAE. So this is called the bramble shark. It's a specialist deep water shark, not harmful to humans. We saw not just this little fellow that you can see here, he's little at two and a half meters long, uh, but many of them off the shoreline of the UAE. So even today we continue to make uh, discoveries uh, in this area. Um, and uh, he was really an inspiration for me. Uh, the book that I first read when I came to the Emirates was this book that he published in 2005, along with uh, Simon Aspinall, who's now passed away as well, um, which was sort of a coffee table overview of the natural history of the UAE. Um, now, the reason I was really interested in talking with Peter about my passion for this project actually originates from my academic background. So I don't refer to anyone who will allow me as We have students from over 125 countries on our campus. There's about 2,500 students. Um, and virtually none of them know anything about the arts. They live on this campus. They go into the city for fun, occasionally to Dubai, and never get out anywhere else. And so I thought, you know, I would really like to introduce these folks to this amazing nation that they live in. And so I started thinking about a course to put together for them while we were going through the pandemic because I had nothing else to do while I stayed home. Um, and which led to this project that I worked with Gary and 20 other authors to pull together these uh, chapters. So we have this resource that I can use with my students or people outside university. I've had emails from people in high school teaching IV programs who are using resources from this book as well. So it's great to be able to sort of give back uh, and educate people about this. And I should point out 14% of our students are Emirati and they know nothing about the Emirates as well, even though they grow up here. Um, so I'm gonna walk through um, the first three chapters of this book as sort of a teaser. And uh, the remainder of the book you can read on your own. Uh, I can tell you it's filled with much more information than I'm going to cover here. And I'm doing something really stupid and dangerous in that I'm going to try and cover uh, what Gary wrote in the very first chapter, which is dangerous given that I have zero background in geology or geography. Uh, but then I'm going to go into uh, the climate, the, sorry, let's just say climate and the marine environment. So this is the physical setting of the UAP. Um, and you have to recognize that the physical setting really is sort of what makes up the, the stage on which the drama of life is all going to play, right? It gives us our, our, um, the framework on which all of our other life sort of extends. Now, when you think about, and I have to take my notes down here because, uh, yeah, again, getting into geology, I'll have to refer to these occasionally. Um, when we're talking about the UAE, you have to recognize that, yes, it is a very small nation, but it's actually a mosaic of a whole bunch of very uh, unusual environments that occur across the Emirates. And when we're talking about geography, this is critically important for life that's around here, much more important even than geology is. And when we're talking about geography, we're not just talking about our physical location on the earth, we're talking about the typography, the landforms, the slope, the type of substrate that you're working on. But you're also talking about things like climate and things like humidity, rainfall, temperature, and so on. Uh, but even things like the vegetation itself uh, comes into geology that sort of underpins all of the rest of life, the entire food web. Um, the only sort of uh, major difference that you have to recognize between, you know, this stage set where the drama of life is getting played out in reality is that, of course, the stage set doesn't change, but the real world does. And sometimes it's very gradual, and sometimes it's extremely rapid in terms of these changes. And that obviously has influence on the life that occurs in these places as well. 
When we're talking about the UAP, basically it's made up of four uh, geographic divisions. What you can see here are in blue is the coastal plains that runs along the coastline of the Arabian Gulf that goes inland for several kilometers. We're going to go through each of these shortly. The largest area being the same deserts. You also have the mountains on the east coast of the UAE, the Hajar Mountains uh, is a large component of this and other areas we'll talk about. Um, as well as the alluvial plains. So the alluvium is the eroded sort of gravel that's coming off the mountains over time. And each of these has its distinct sort of environmental characteristics. And so they're quite unique in terms of their substrate materials, their elevation, the amount of rainfall that they get, all of these things that we talk about as being important in structuring life. And therefore, we get differences in the types of organisms that will occur in each of these different areas. And we have patient drug they have for these different environments. And so when we're talking about the coastal plains, as I mentioned, this is a relatively flat topography that goes from the coastline of the Arabian Gulf and extends inland for some distance. It's a number of kilometers that sort of vary depending on the slope of the, the areas. Um, and historically, this was largely unbroken from the coastline of Saudi Arabia at Sila all the way up until you get to Ras al-Khaim and Shams. Um, obviously, development has had extensive impacts on these areas. When you think of the footprint of Dubai alone and the amount of dredging and things like that that have gone on in Abu Dhabi, it's quite extensive. So they're heavily degraded, but they still do include a number of important landforms. Uh, some of those examples are here. You can see the white sandy beaches. These used to extend basically from the border of Abu Dhabi and Dubai all the way up to Ras um, but it has been largely uh, degraded due to development, unfortunately, or you can't access them because it's private. We also have large extensive areas of Sabhas. Um, the Sabhas in the UAE are actually of global significance to geologists uh, for studying the topic of petroleum reserves form and so on. We have huge and extensive lagoon systems here. So these are sheltered environments that many times will go almost dry during the low tides and serve as important feeding areas for migratory birds, for example. Um, there are questions being raised right now, and I would love in particular about should we be doing all this afforestation with a million or 10 million uh, mangrove tree uh, plantation programs when you're actually removing mud flat habitat that is very important for certain bird species that are here, for example. Um, obviously, in this total uh, band, we also have our mangrove forests, which typically would occur in those lagoons, although they don't entirely, which are often uh, surrounded by um, salt marshes as well. And you got to think that mangroves, not only are they important, and you can go read the whole chapter on this, but this is the only natural evergreen forest in Arabia. Like when you think of the palm groves and all that, that's domesticated crops function, right? So this is, this is it. Um, so they're remarkable in terms of their biological importance uh, as well as the cultural importance. Then you have things like your, your rocky substrates, like your fossilized dunes that we can see in Western Abu Dhabi, as well as the rocky promontories that do extend into the coastal fringe, uh, particularly the northern ends, um, and extend down into the, the sea. We'll discuss that a little bit more later. Going away from uh, the, the coastal fringe and into the sand deserts, these are obviously uh, the habitat or the geographic sort of uh, demarcation that makes up the largest part of the UAE, the largest component of the UAE, uh, as you can see here. And when most of us are thinking of the sandy desert, you're thinking of the right, the big giant sand dunes that you see around Liwa that are extending up something like 150 meters and extending off into the horizon of the Rizal Khali. Uh, but they are not the only types of deserts that they have here. Um, as you leave the coastline, and, uh, sorry, as you leave the inland areas where you've got those massive large dunes and you move towards the coast, uh, you'll start to see transition. So the coastal dune systems, as you can see on the right hand side here, are largely white in color uh, versus the ones that are inland that have more of a sort of reddish color to them. And it's a difference in origin of the sands that are making these up. Those that are inland uh, are actually uh, eroded alluvium that's been bouncing around by the wind and earlier by the rain coming from Saudi Arabia. So the central so the Arabian plateau is uplifted as the Red Sea ridges off um, as we moved away from the African plate. Um, and that's been eroding over time. Um, and the color that you see there is largely because it has iron in it, so it's rust. Um, which gives that reddish color versus those on the coast. If you actually look at the sand grains, you'll see that a lot of them are made up of shell hatch. So they're, they're marine in origin, okay? 
Um, so some of it's uh, geochemical, but a lot of it's just shells that have been broken up over time to give us beautiful white sandy beaches that we're looking at. Today. And even still, you have other types of sandy deserts here uh, or dune systems here. You can see this uh, up here in the top right. This would be up towards Rasalpima um, in that general area. You can see that there's large dune systems that are actually migrating towards the mountains or migrating away from them. Right now, we're in a period where uh, the dune systems are waning because it's quite dry. It's been very dry for the last 5,000 years. But before that, this area was very humid. It was more like a savanna. And so uh, these, there's a dance, an interplay that's going on between the alluvium bands as well as the, the sand dunes that are here. Uh, currently, the sand dunes are wind. Um, and when we're talking about these uh, city landscapes, there's obviously variation uh, in, in what they look like, how they form, and so on. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, the classic high dune system that you have around the Liwa. They extend upwards. Typically of around 150 meters above a set of plain as you can see in the background here. So that's not, uh, so that's a, a relatively flat uh, salt flat that's at the bottom of these. These are typically about 100 kilometers inland from the coast uh, towards the edge of the Rula Ali. Um, but you may be surprised to learn that even though we've got these massive dune systems here, these are actually low in elevation compared to most of the dune systems in the UAE. If you think about the last slide, the ones that are near the mountains, they're much higher elevation than these are. And in fact, these, oh, this is going to be painful if it continues all night. Um, sorry. Um, uh, and if you think about these uh, pans, these salt pans, these sapphires that you see in the background here, they're actually only about <laughs> oh, here, sorry. Bad. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, there we go. They're actually only just above uh, the, the water table in many cases, which is when you think about it, it makes sense. Where's Liwa Oasis? It's right at the edge of this Ruba Ali, um, where these uh, salt pans at the base of these large dunes are just sitting above the water table. Now, these large dune systems will uh, sort of transition and give way to sandy plains that you can see here in the center, and eventually the gravel plains as you get over towards the coastline, where you tend to get these barking dunes. So the ones that you see that are crescent shaped, those are mobile dunes that are formed by just the drying of the wind. Um, you can go further north and northeast, and you'll start to see dune systems like this with gap trees in them. Uh, these, the gap is the national tree of the UAE, if you're not aware of that. And you tend to see them in little groves all together, little tops of trees. Um, and it's thought that these are actually remnants. So these are vestiges of the warmer weather time uh, several millennia ago when things were savanna around here and sort of dominated the entire ecosystem. And what you're seeing left are the leftovers that haven't died because they still have access to some groundwater that's sitting under them in, in these different areas. And even further afield, you'll start to see rocky promontories, uh, typically limestone based, uh, coming out of the, the sands. And these have really unique geology, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And so they often have uh, species that are quite unique to those areas and not found anywhere else in that sandy environment. What about the mountains? So these are the ones that are most uh, sort of charismatic, attractive to people for camping and things like that. Um, you can see that the mountains basically extend from the Musandam Peninsula across the east coast of the UAE, and they will continue down to Oman until basically the Ras al Had. This is largely made up by the chain of mountains that's called the Hajar Mountains. Um, and we'll discuss a little bit about the geology of these um, a, a bit later. But it makes up a large part of Jera, a large part of uh, Ras al Khaimah, and then there's bits of Dubai, Sharjah, and some other Emirates uh, in here as well. Now, we'll discuss a little bit later about the climate of the mountains, but obviously the mountains do receive more rainfall than the rest of the UAE does, and that has impacts on the life that forms there. Uh, so we do consider the mountains to be arid rather than paper arid, which is what, you know, the Ruba Khali and places like Dubai are. Um, and they're also much more diverse in terms of the topography, the geomorphology, and things like that, which gives it a lot of different microhabitats for different organisms to grow in. And as a result, we do get a lot of diversity of organisms that occur in the mountains relative to other parts of the country. It's the most biodiverse area of the UAE. Uh, so if you take, for example, uh, the size of the mountains, they make up only 5% of the area of the UAE, but they contain over 60% of the vegetation species in the Emirates. 
and similar numbers are around. It hasn't been collated officially yet, but it's somewhere around as well. Um, the mountains are also incredibly important as a center for endemism. For those of you who are familiar with that term, endemic means it's a species that only lives in that area. And so these are all species that are endemic to the Hadjar Mountains here in the UAE. They're found nowhere else. Well, UAE and, and Northern Oman. Um, so they are found nowhere else on Earth and are obviously very important to um, conservation value as a result of that. So they're really adapted to the specific environmental conditions in that area. I'm just looking at the Hadjar Mountains in a little more detail. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the Luz al Jabal, which is up here a little bit later, but this is the Hadjar Range uh, running down here. Um, and what you can see is it's running basically from Diba through Thorpeton down to the southern end of the Pajara, and then we'll carry on through into Oman. Um, this is largely, and I'll discuss this a little bit later, but because we had uh, the crops and the mantle, the earth, we had an uplifting because of a process that I'll discuss a little bit later where the big cracks sort of bent upwards here. So you're actually seeing in this area um, rock that was uh, created because of magnetism functionally. Um, so these, these are um, uh, rocks that are called opiolite, and there's two forms of opiolite that you see here. The ones on this side over here are more associated with the crust of the earth, so the top uh, layer, if you want to think of that. Um, and that's the gabbro that you see in this picture here. Um, so they typically have this really reddish brown sort of coloration to them. Um, and these are actually quite friendly for plants. So plants you will see uh, growing in these areas fairly well versus the, and I always mispronounce this, Harzburgite, hello? Very healthy. Harzburgite. Harzburgite. Um, um, then you see in purple here extending up towards the back in the background. Is that mainly originating from the mantle? And it has a geochemistry that is very unfriendly for plants. And so you tend to have very low vegetation growth in those areas or species that are specialists on that type of geology. Um, and so you'll find them nowhere else uh, in the Hedger Mountain. Losing my clicker. There we go. And obviously, in the mountains, one of the things we're all thinking in are the wadis, which are eroded uh, river valleys, if you want to think of it that way. If you're at the base of one of the larger wadis, what you'll notice is that it's typically very dry and not a lot of vegetation. And like you see in the picture on the right, which is sort of cut off at the bottom, but it would just be a gravel wash there with no vegetation. The reason for that is when it does rain, you get a black flood running through these, which rips out any vegetation that's there, or most of it. Where you tend to get vegetation forming in the wadis is rather than the upper reaches towards the tops of the mountains, where you have a more gentle slope, there's less water running through them when it does rain. And so the water will stay and gravel and get an image there and give these uh, plants a chance to survive. Um, how is it that this is happening? Well, you've got to recognize that in the base of the wadis, you've got gravel, right? So we've got a cross section here at the top and a longitudinal section here at the bottom. And so, you know, we've got this bedrock of opiolite, the, the rock that's there. It may have some cracks and crevices in it, but it's largely impervious, okay? Um, but it does erode over time, and it builds up in these valleys to, to make an alluvium base of gravel. And so when it does rain, it'll run off this rock and go down into these valleys and basically percolate through the gravel uh, slowly. And as, like I did uh, part of a uh, uh, master's degree on this stuff, so I can talk about this for hours, but as it's going through, there's lots of chemical changes that are happening with the water and the nutrients that are happening uh, in the water because of the bacteria that's in here. But what is happening as it goes through this gravel bed and it's running down through here is that occasionally the bedrock will form sill. And when it does that, the water just pools up and pools up until it basically appears like these ponds that you can see up here. So all of these ponds that you're looking at, they look stagnant, they look like they're disgusting, but the water is actually flowing through, just flowing at a very slow rate if it's not raining too recently. Um, and if you stick your hand in them, even in the middle of summer, you'll notice that the water's quite cool because it's coming from underground um, and just popping up in these areas where we have the bed rocks in the same and these, these fresh water, so we have no streams in the UAE which are continuously flowing throughout their extent, but we do have tons and tons of these ponds. I remember reading a paper by Gary from the 1990s that said there was, at that time, before a lot of wells were put in place, we had 27 permanent water features within the Emirates itself. And uh, these are critically important for biodiversity. 
Um, if you take, for example, fish, they don't live very well if they don't have water, obviously. Um, we have uh, the, the, oh, what's the name of this fish? The, the heads are looked at, but it's down at the bottom. I'm not familiar with in the orange here, Gara, which you have up here. Uh, both of them occur in the heads around the cereals and down in species. But you also have things like insect species that cannot live outside of water, like your little big beetles, your water scorpion. It's not actually a scorpion, this is for breeding. Um, and then you even got, when you think about it, most insects, okay, other than things like moss, the vast majority of insects have to lay their eggs in water. So this is mosquitoes, this is damselflies, dragonflies, uh, stoneflies, mayflies, all of those different organisms will lay their eggs in water to complete their life cycle. So if they don't have water, they die. And so when you look at these larvae that are in there, they spend the vast majority of their life in there feeding, and then they'll take off, reproduce, and die. Uh, okay, so going off from the hedger mountain rains, we get to the Rusal Jabal. And so this is the area that's, so here's the headguards that we were just looking at. The Rusal Jabal is this area that's over here, uh, geomorphically and geologically different. Um, here we have much higher mountains. So typically the mountains in the, the Hedra mountains won't extend higher than a thousand meters at the highest points in, in the UAE at least. Here we've got mountains that regularly will hit uh, 1,500 meters, and the highest point is uh, down in, in sorry, oh, in Oman, which is Jebel Berin, which uh, goes over uh, 2,000 meters. Sorry, okay. Um, these are quite geographically and geologically unique. Um, what you can see looking at this picture on the left really demonstrates it. It's functionally, this is a, a, a large block or slab of sedimentary carbonate rock. So the rock that has been made from particles of sediments building off in the bottom of the ocean, many millennia, well, many hundreds of millions of years ago, that has now been uplifted. So this block is about three kilometers thick. Um, and it is interesting from the perspective of being different from the other areas that we talked about, and that is quite a forest. So water really broke this um, very easily, and so we have lots of caves and other crevices and things like that. And so when it rains, the rain disappears. So we very rarely have surface water in this area. Um, but we do also have another difference in terms of the elevation. It's much colder up there. So at different times of year, you'll have seasonal um, uh, farming that goes on. Uh, and that occurs at the top of the plateaus because of the cooler temperatures in those areas versus in the Hajar Mountains. If you think of where the ferns are there, they're not on the tops of the mountains, they're all on the bottom of the wadis, right? Because that's where the water is. So different drivers and sort of cultural appropriation in these areas. <clears throat> uh, the other set of mountains most people don't really think about uh, because they're not really mountains are the four land bridges. So the classic one that all of you will have visited will be Jebel Peaks down here by Alani, uh, which rises, I'm trying to remember, something like uh, 1,500 meters. 1,200. 1,200? Okay, 1,200 meters, uh, but it extends about 20 kilometers in length. Um, very unique diversity there because of the types of species that associate with the geology in that area. Um, so, for example, this species of plant that you can see here is people poplar in Arabic, um, and this giant mud skipper basically, so this only occurs in the north of Jebel uh, in all of the UAE, and this giant mud skipper that you see will associate with these plants that the larvae feed on it, and so they functionally only live at that part of the UAE, obviously of high importance uh, in terms of conservation value as a result of this. Um, now, these carbonate rocks are much younger than the ones that were up here. So, these ones are from what, like roughly 70 million years ago, Gary? Something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, 60, 65, 65 million years ago. So, so, far younger than the ones that were up here. Um, and uh, we also have this uh, section here. Many of you would have visited Fossil Rock, for example, Jebel Taya, the Hartford area. That's the ones, the smaller ones that are being indicated a little bit uh, north. Um, many of these uh, plants that you find in these areas are what are called opiolite avoiders, so they don't look to opiolite things up the head of our mountains. Um, and as a result, you only find them in these four line bridges, uh, as an example. So, completely again, the same from stuff that's just 20 kilometers away from the main mountain uh, fringe itself. Now, if you're leaving the mountains now, we're moving into the, the fourth division that we talked about, which is the alluvial plains. And so the alluvium, again, is that eroded gravel that's coming off the mountain every time it rains. 
Obviously, the history of EOD had a lot more rain than it has today. And so what you're witnessing is something the ghost of Christmas Pat, if you want to think of it that way. When you're looking at these areas with large gravel beds that can extend down many tens of meters, sometimes even hundreds of meters, depending on where you are. And these will extend uh, off both sides of the mountains on the, the eastern flank as well as the western flank. And on the western side, they'll eventually grade into the desert in these areas where you see the sand dunes sort of dancing on the different angle. Um, these are obviously important for a whole bunch of different species, but the one you'd be most familiar with are the acacia trees, the umbrella corn acacia that you can see here um, in great supply in Jera, but you'll see similar amounts uh, over by Bay, for example. Um, and the reason that you see them in these areas is they have what are called tap roots. So they have these roots that extend very deep to be able to access the water that's running underground coming off the mountains, even in the middle of summer, uh, to keep them going. Sorry, for those of you at home, I'm having technical issues appearing regularly on my laptop, so I'm trying to deal with those while getting some. Okay. Um, and just to sort of close up our geography and geology section, um, zooming out a little bit on more of a global scale, you have to recognize that the UAE really does represent a biogeographic nexus point for the exchange of organisms from a whole bunch of different regions. So the three principal regions uh, for the influx of biodiversity have been the Paleoarctic, the Afrotropical region, as well as the Oriental, but obviously Abu Dhabi and UAE is, sorry, not Abu Dhabi, the Emirates UAE sits within uh, what's called the Arabian zone, which just means Arab, um, and that really structures the life that's able to come in and colonize this area that we have here. Um, and just some examples of organisms that you may be familiar with from this region. So we just talked about the umbrella of Coronagacea. You've also got the desert broom here. These are coming in to us from uh, an African origin, for example. So you'll see these in the savannas of Africa. If you go down to a, 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 a safari, safari uh, in those areas, sorry, I'm stumbling with my words. Uh, you have, for example, the mountain spurge, as well as uh, our the gap tree. They are coming to us from an Asian route. So if you go over to places like Pakistan or India, you'd be able to find these species there. One that most of you probably don't even know exists here. You might because of Gary, uh, his presence at these talks, um, is the uh, olive tree, which occurs here in Jara, probably at one of the most southern extents of this species, I'd imagine, um, up in the Hajar Mountains of Jara. Um, and then in terms of the desert adapted uh, organisms, um, we have from the uh, Arabic zone here this uh, plant called a zoom, for example, and the uh, desert white butterfly, which you'll find all across that Arabic zone. They're very, very common. And it's probably if you went catching butterflies this weekend, you're going to get lots of these and not much of everything else. Um, but they're, they're all over the place. Oops, getting quicker. Okay. And just as a little bit of a side on geology, I mentioned earlier that geology is not really important for light here. Um, because geography is so prominent in terms of all the things that we've been discussing and driving away. And when you think about geology, the only area of the UAE where you can actually see geology in the Arns is over here in the mountains, which we've been discussing uh, earlier. Uh, everywhere else is buried by sand. So you're not really seeing the geology, and therefore it's not going to have any real influence on life. And so when you look at the larger UAE as a cross section, as you see here, you can see that there's a whole bunch of different layers of sort of deposited sediments that have built up over time. And this would have started around the Cambrian period, so around 550 million years ago, when we started to get, you know, shortly after the start of multicellular life, and there's things starting to fossilize and, and stuff like that. And so this has been building up and building up, and over time, organisms are getting trapped as it sinks to the bottom of the young sea at that time. I assume it was a tenant, so I'm not sure. But as the sediments are building up and trapping these organisms, they're being put into this pressure cooker, geological pressure cooker over time, which is converting these algae and other microorganisms eventually into oil. And that oil will migrate through these layers until it can't migrate anymore. It's caught in a trap. Uh, a typical trap uh, around here is going to be a salt dome, a salt diaper. And uh, you'll see these in places like Abu Dhabi, is, and this is where most of our oil is, is in Abu Dhabi, would be like the various jungles. So, um, uh, 
Why can I not look at any area now? Bobaras, uh, Zanam, uh, Bass Islands, uh, Subenias Islands, um, even what's another class? Almost all, yeah. Yeah, Delma. All of those islands are functionally salt domes, and underneath them, uh, it would attract whales because they can't migrate up anymore. And so you see them getting pushed up as iron function. And so that was being indicated uh, sort of here. Um, if you actually want to see what these layers look like, you can actually go to the Musadam and go hiking, and you'll see those various different layers of the same materials uh, built up in that area. It's just that there's no oil trapped in those areas. So don't, don't go getting your hands up, you're going to earn diligence. Um, what's something else I wanted to mention there? Uh, oh, yes, sand dunes. So we all think the UAE is sandy. It's super, super, super superficial. Um, we only have less than 200 meters of sand sitting on top of all of this stuff. And so, as I mentioned, the geology here isn't really driving things. It's the geography and the geomorphology of these places driving things. So all of our geology is sort of hidden away from view, but um, uh, covered by this. Thing. I mentioned earlier that our mountains were uh, formed by the uplift uh, of the uh, the Eurasian plate, there's the Arabian plate. So the Arabian plate has been pulling off of the uh, the African plate for about 70 million years. And that has been pulling off. You've had the formation of the Red Sea because they're splitting from one another. But as it's moving towards the Eurasian plate, they're pressing up against one another. And unfortunately, the Arabian plate lost this battle. And so what's happening is it's slowly sliding underneath the Eurasian plate over there. But what that does is, as it's bending under, it's causing this lift to sort of get forced up. That's what's giving us those Hajar mountains that we were looking at earlier, where you see the cross cross section, the mantle cross section, and a little bit of other stuff uh, in there. Um, and it's not shown here, but there's also a huge series of mountains over here called the Zagros Mountains in Iran, which are much bigger than the mountains we have here in the UAE that are being caused by this same process of this Arabian plate driving up and over that area. And the Zagros aren't really important to us here in the UAE, other than they really funnel winds, which, as we'll discuss later, is important to them. And so you can see here that sort of layer that got crushed up, and we've got sort of sand sitting on top of the layer that's getting pushed down from underneath. And so this, this uplift, uplifted component is now eroding just because of time or anything. And so you can see, as we saw earlier, lots of this area was. Is Gabro over here? And I don't have my glasses on. Um, sorry, Gabro in this area. Actually, like, oh, I can say that word. It's all opula. <laughs> all of these purple areas. Um, and you occasionally get some uh, mesomorphic rocks, which were uh, sediments that got trapped and really heated up and put under pressure. And so, if you've been to Wadi Asima or Wadi Taiba by Masafi and gone through there with your vehicle, if you're an off road, you probably have, and you've seen metallic looking rocks, that's those rocks. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the big carbonate block up here in Pusadam and some uh, down here by Jebel Zaki and so on. Okay, so that brings us off of the sort of uh, the stage on which life is playing out. And then you've got the other actors that are in this uh, driving life. Uh, first, that we'll discuss is the climate, which relates to the marine environment, which we'll discuss last. Um, so I don't know how many of you have looked at maps like this, but I teach environmental sciences, so I look at them all the time. And I remember being in like high school and looking at this and just wondering why is it that some areas are green and some areas are not green. Um, and uh, we are obviously sitting, like if you speak Arabic, you know that Sahara means desert, right? And uh, this whole area that you can see across here is desert, but there's lots of other desert areas as well. The, the, the desert in Australia, the Patagonia, the Panama deserts down here, and so on. What's driving a large part of what is a desert versus what is not is actually happening because of the atmosphere. And it's something that's very predictable and we've known about for a couple of centuries now. Um, the first guy that started working on this was a guy named Gustav Pedley. So he gets uh, his name on the first cell that we learned about. Um, and what's actually going on is when you think about the sun shining on the earth, where is the earth going to get most of its sunlight? It's not going to be at the poles, it's going to be around the equator, right? And so the earth warms up around the equator more than anywhere else does. And as a result, we get it there because it's warming up, it will rise because it's just lower density. But as it's rising, it's taking moisture with it. Okay, and so as that air rises, it pulls moisture with it. And so when you look at a map of the world, leaving the clouds in, 
you'll see around the equator this band of clouds because it's dumping out rain in those areas. So as it's rising up, sorry, I should say it here. Um, as it's rising up, it cools, and then the water that had been vapor uh, condenses out and turns into rain in those areas. But what that means is once the air finally hits the, the bottom of the stratosphere, stratosphere it's called the, the tropopause, once it hits that glass ceiling and starts to split, it's now dry air, okay? And then it'll migrate because it's still getting pushed up from below by this rising air, it can't go back down. So it gets pushed north and it gets pushed south. And so what it does, now this would go all the way to the North Pole and the South Pole if we had a planet that was not spinning, but of course we are on a spinning planet. And so Coriolis forces rip these, these uh, circulations into three cells. There's one here that runs basically from the equator up to over 30 degrees. There's another one up to 60 degrees, and then there's another one at the poles at 90 degrees. They have different names. Um, but the one that's around here is called the Hadley cell. And what you can see from this diagram is as this air is risen, yes, it's been warm, it's getting up here, it's now cool, um, but it's dry. And this cool air migrates 30 degrees north and then it starts to drop because it's no longer getting pushed up from below, right? But as it drops, it's now number one, it's dry. And then there's a process in physics we call adiabatic heating. So as that air is dropping, it's warming up, and it makes it even more desiccated as it comes down. That's the air that's landing on your head when you walk outside. Okay. Um, and so when you look at um, uh, where it's dropping down, that's the Tropic of Cancer right there. And you can see you're sitting somewhere in this green box here. And so you are right at the spot where that air is falling down from the tropopause, from the stratosphere, basically the bottom of the stratosphere, um, that's bringing this hot air to air right across the Tropic of Cancer, which is why if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, you've got the Sahara, Arabia, and various other places that you continue on. And if you look, the Southern Hemisphere doesn't have as much land, but if you look at 30 degrees south, you'll see the Atacama Desert, the Great Desert of Australia, Namib Desert, all of those are now 30 degrees south. Um, okay, so I'm going to walk through. So I'm a scientist, I love graphics and graphs, but uh, I almost will hate them, so I'll take my time to walk through some of these. Um, so we've got here a map of uh, what's going on with the winds in January, uh, and this is averaged over roughly 40 years. So this is a model that my colleague and I developed, uh, as well as in July. So winter versus summer, basically an average of 40 years. But looking at the winter over here, what you can see is functionally, sorry, should be keeping track of my notes to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, uh, during the winter, basically, you've got this high pressure zone sort of sits over the center of Arabia, roughly right here. Uh, so that's where the air is dropping down. But because of the Earth spinning, we get this Coriolis force working on that air. What it does is it causes things to bend to the right because we're in the northern hemisphere. It's the opposite of the southern hemisphere. And so what you can see is this large swirl of air that's going around where this air is dropping in this particular region of Arabia. And what that does is it gives us these winds that are almost consistently from the north northwest. And so if you go out tomorrow afternoon, if you think of it, and just face the wind, I can almost guarantee you're going to be, unless there's a storm, you're going to be moving upwards to wait. Um, just by coincidence, this isn't by design, but during the winter time, we had a shift. So uh, during the summertime, the, where the sun is relative to the earth moves north. Okay, so where that rising air and sinking air is moves north. And so we actually have this area here that runs from sort of uh, Battle Landed Strait up through Arabia here. This is the area where the wind is rising, okay, or the air is rising. So the land is heating up here, air is rising. It's a low pressure zone. If air is rising, something has to come in to replace it. And so you can see there's air moving in from this direction. Again, that gives us these north northwest winds, almost exactly the same direction we have in the wintertime, just from a different cause. But we also have some winds that are trying to move in from over this direction. But I mentioned we have Coriolis forces, right? And so they're bending this wind again to the right. And what we're getting as a result of that is our monsoon. So this is the Indian Ocean monsoon. Because this uh, band will extend down into Somalia here. Um, and so we have a very strong jet of wind that wants to go into Arabia, but because of the Coriolis forces, it's getting bent, and it will run all the way up to India and give you the monsoon rains that uh, keeps people alive uh, in the subcontinent, for example. 
Um, these uh, winds are really important. Uh, so this is an example showing you again the summer winds uh, and a, a map showing you uh, an animation of what's going on with these winds as they move across the Gulf. What happens is occasionally you get this um, this this process that's occurring here, um, uh, weakening. Uh, sorry. Uh, Weakening and that will allow stronger winds to come in from the Mediterranean and punch across the Gulf. Um, this could be really important because these winds are functionally the equivalent of you blowing on a coffee when they're running across the Gulf. And so, why do you blow on a coffee? You're trying to cool it down. How are you cooling it down? In physics, it's called latent flux. You're evaporating water off out and it takes energy with it. Uh, same thing happens with these winds as they run across the Gulf. It pulls heat out of the Gulf, and that's why if you have a period of like two or three days of strong winds in August, it feels disgusting outside for the next week. It's like a sweatshop. Um, that's what's going on in the summertime. And so if you have a period in the summertime where you don't have winds, this is what you get. Because the winds aren't there to cool the water, the water temperatures will slowly go towards air temperatures, which, as you know, are like 40 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius in the summertime. And so you'll get things like coral bleaching occurring. Uh, this is summer of 2017. We'll look at a little bit of data of this a bit later, but an incredibly hot year because there was no wind at that summer. Um, Shamals are also important in the winter time. They can also they can cool things down so much that you can get cold water bleaching. So this is the only place in the world where we have hot water bleaching corals as well as cold water bleaching corals, which is pretty crazy. Um, but you can have things like deaths of marine reptiles in the winter time because they're cold stunned because of shamal events that are running through cooling down water towards them. So those are sort of the larger scale phenomena that are occurring on a day-to-day -day basis. We get this. You may be familiar with it if you're a sailor. Um, so we had it virtually every day. It starts around one o'clock. It builds through the afternoon around three or four. If you walk outside, there's always a pleasant breeze coming off the sea. Um, and that's all the sea breeze. And so what's happening is somewhere out by Atlanta, the land is warming up. Because the air is warming up, it expands and rises. And so you'll get the the cooler air that's over the sea coming in to replace it in the afternoon of every single day, pretty much. Um, and so when I go sailing on my sailboat, we often make use of this by heading out at one o'clock and we'll stay up until just before dark because this stops as soon as it's dark. Um, as soon as it's dark, you have the opposite pattern where you get what's called a land breeze. This is uh, stronger in the mornings where the land will cool down overnight and the water becomes warm. Right? So because the water holds on to the temperature much better than the soil does. And so the, the sea will hold that temperature, it will become warmer, the water, will, the air will start rising over the sea and pull it in off the land. So you'll always feel in the morning, slight breeze coming off the land going towards the sea. So just start to pay attention to it and you'll notice these things in the mirror. It's particularly strong about in Dubai. Less so around mountain areas. Um, there's also weird things just because of our location on Earth, our latitude where we are. And this actually spins as you go through the day. So most places it goes land breeze, then sea breeze, just like 180 degrees. Here it goes around the clock, um, just because of those coriolan forces that we were talking about earlier. And so if I'm going sailing and I know it's going to be a good day for sailing, I know that the wind's going to start off the land in the morning and slowly go towards the west and then eventually come to the north and northwest, which is the best winds for sailing here. And then it'll eventually taper off and die around sunset somewhere around east. Okay. Um, what about the temperature of the UAE? And this is the average over 40 years, uh, looking at the January minimum and maximum temperatures, and then July, so summer, minimum and maximum temperatures. Um, and what you can functionally see is that, yeah, there's a big difference in temperatures between winter and summer here. Surprise! Um, but you can also see that there's a large variation in spatial, uh, where you tend to get the greatest variation in temperatures tends to be inland, uh, away from the sea. So the sea will buffer the temperatures, uh, controlling things around the coastline. And so you don't tend to get as extreme variability um, uh, on the coastline, uh, which is where most of us live. Uh, what about the long-term temperature trend? So this is looking at the temperatures uh, in the 1980s functionally versus the last decade, uh, the 2010s, uh, if you want to think of it that way. And what you can see here is if you look at every single one of these locations and then you compare 
today versus the 1980s, if we're functionally one degree Celsius hotter in every single location. Now, I know one degree Celsius does not sound like a big increase in temperature over the course of 40 years, but what's the number that the UN is using as their sort of cutoff point where we're going to start seeing catastrophic impacts on people and ecosystems? Anyone know? 1.5. So 1.5 degrees Celsius, we are already well on our way there here in the UN. We're at one degree Celsius, and we're warming faster than the global average. I'm not a physicist, so I'm not a global why. Um, uh, I think I did not extension with my geography lecture earlier. Really. Um, uh, but this is a little bit burning. Uh, what about rainfall patterns? So, again, this is looking at winter, December, January, February, spring, uh, summer, so June, July, August, and then uh, September, October, November as our autumn. And what you can see is big surprise, it rains the most in the, the winter time. So, in the period we're sitting in right now is when we get most of the rainfall. Um, and most of the rainfall spatially is occurring around the mountains. And this is partially because of the wind direction, but largely it's due to the fact that the mountains are higher. So they force uh, air up. And because the clouds have to rise, it gets colder, they condense easier, and then you get more rainfall as a result of that. Uh, for those of you who live in Dubai or potentially Abu Dhabi in this room, uh, blaming it all on cloud seeding when you get stuck at home because of the weather. Uh, you don't do cloud seeding at all in the UAE or Abu Dhabi or uh, Dubai. All of it occurs above that line. So stop blaming it on cloud seeding when you get stuck. <laughs> um, what about the long term precipitation trends? So this one's a, uh, a little bit blurry. Um, so this is looking at the 1980s again versus the last decade. Uh, and the amount of rainfall that occurs in different parts of the country. As you can see, most of the rainfall still happens in the Hadzara Mountains. Not a big surprise, we have more moving mountains. Uh, but what you can see is dramatic drops in the amount of rainfall across the Emirates pretty much everywhere. Uh, and basically, most of the uh, uh, rainfall has halved uh, relative to the 1980s. So we're getting half the precipitation that we had uh, back then. Now, the decline in the Hadjar Mountains and Musa Dam has been less extreme, uh, but it is still significant, I guess is what I want to say. This is obviously going to be important for vegetation because if they're already uh, an arid, stressed uh, organism, making it even more arid is going to be a problem. But that's going to kick on to the rest of the food web that relies on the vegetation, right? And so this is definitely going to have a biological impact, which means it has to the animals. Um, and this is particularly going to be troubling for endemic species. So species that I discussed earlier that only occur in Jabal Dafid or in the Hector Mountains or whatever. I should point out, however, um, because Gary will knight me in the back if I don't, that uh, rainfall is highly variable here. So any of you who spent more than a decade here know that from year to year we get differences in rainfall, but even decade to decade, there's a lot of variability in this year. So the question is, is this a trend uh, that we're going to see continuing worsening, or is this just a blip between the 1980s and the current day? And this is a question that's currently in your uh, attention for research. What about the wind? Uh, so this is showing you uh, winter, spring, summer, and um, uh, uh, fall winds. And what you can see here is that the wind looks largely the same everywhere all around, which may surprise you given the conversations we had on the importance of shamals and things like and cyclone feeding happening here. But you got to recognize that those are very short term events uh, that are only a couple of days a year. On average, everything is the, the sea breezes that we talked about earlier. And there's been no appreciable change in winds around this region uh, over the last 40 years. That may sound like a good thing, but in actuality, if things are getting warmer and we're not getting the, the secret, the stronger small wind effects cooling the Gulf, what does that mean? We're gonna have a hotter Gulf without the cooling sort of conditioning of, uh, of the, um, the, the wind going across the Gulf, which may bode um, uh, an ill fate for coral reefs here, for example. Uh, there's something that's relatively esoteric to people who are inclined to solve the wet bulb temperature. This is basically how happy do people feel being outside. Uh, it's thought that at 35 degrees Celsius, this is the maximum wet bulb temperature that if you go beyond it, it's sort of lethal temperatures for humans because the humidity and the heat combination makes it untenable for you to stay alive. 
Um, and this is looking at uh, the June and August average uh, wet bulb temperatures. And you can see that we're well below the 35 uh, degree Celsius mark that's there. Um, this is showing you the 1980s up to uh, the last uh, period. Um, what you can see is there has been a, a slight increase in wet bulb temperatures by about one degree Celsius in many of the locations across the UAE. But it's uh, it's not um, approaching yet the areas that are important for human health. Um, I should point out though that this is something that people who work on domestic livestock, for example, in the UAE, are very concerned about, and they're doing research on it right now. Nobody is doing research on the influence of temperatures, and humidity, and things like that on native organisms that live out here in the environment. So it is an area that's relatively open for um, research. I'm just going to skip the entire next section because I recognize that we are getting uh, well beyond time. And I'm just going to scroll down if you give me a second. And then I'll just see. Screen sharing has stopped. I don't know why it stopped. There's no reason to chase you out, John. You certainly have time to generalize uh, if you want. Yeah, okay. That's what, exactly what I'll do then. Um, and I will. And I have to go back to Zoom to share my slides. Um, so what I was saying, so the uh, third chapter I was just going to go to the third chapter. I show so fast. Just the heat at its maximum is nine meters, so that's like two hundred five hundred fifty two milliwatt. Oh, wow. Nope. Carry on. Sorry. Yeah, I know that's so I've had to transfer. Speak. Uh, I'll go over here for a minute. Um, anyway, I'm not speaking that up. Uh, so the Arabian Gulf is really shallow, becomes the world's hottest sea in the summertime, and one of the coldest tropical seas in the wintertime. Hugely interesting in terms of climate change research, and I'm happy to talk with people after the fact and note that before I come back to the lecture. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. <laughs> test one, two, test one, two. Good. <laughs> All right, so that uh, sort of gives you the foundation for what goes on in the remainder of this book. That space that we uh, started talking about at the beginning, which was actually an idea I stole from Gary because it does uh, give us this framework on which all of what in the UAE, all the ecosystems and the organisms that we have uh, go on. <clears throat> um, so just to give you a quick snapshot in one minute and a half, and I'll close up. Um, what are the various different sections of the book that we haven't talked about today? So we didn't get into the marine environment here, which I think is one of the most interesting aspects of UAE, being a marine scientist. Um, but we also have a whole section that looks at the ecosystems of the, uh, of the Emirates. So we talked about the vegetation broadly across the Emirates and how that links to the geography that we talked about a little bit earlier. The mountain systems are mangrove forests uh, separately from the lagoons because the lagoons are much more important. There's many uh, charismatic megafauna that live in there that you just learned about, for example. Many of you may not be aware, but the UBE has over 4% of the entire world's seagrass beds in terms of area, um, mostly being in Abu Dhabi. We have incredibly important sea beds that are functionally only around in the late winter to early spring. Really important as a fisheries uh, nursery habitat for organisms that live in those areas. 
And then, of course, the world's most tolerant coral reefs. Um, these have gotten a beating on the Arabian Gulf Coast over the last uh, decades, uh, because largely due to climate change, um, not much in terms of development, to be honest. Um, but we're learning a lot about the corals that are there and the specifics on how we're able to adapt. So I'm actually, uh, we've already published a paper in Science Advances, and we've got a multi-million dollar project right now looking at selective breeding programs where we're cross-breeding corals uh, from the Arabian Gulf with the same species of corals from other parts of the world to look at the heritability of thermal uh, tolerance in these corals as one example of some of our work. And then, of course, there's the oyster beds that have been uh, historically extremely important to the economy and culture of the UAE itself. So you can learn all about these very different uh, ecosystems in the second section of the book. In the third section of the book, we've got this uh, both in terms of uh, terrestrial organisms and marine organisms. So we talk about flora, so this is Turbulus, the title of the Journal of the Emirates Natural History Group. That's the organism that it's named after. We've got the mammals, things like the Arabian tar, and uh, birds. So uh, fascinating. So I don't know anything about birds. I'm not a butcher, but I learned a ton by reading Oscar Campbell's uh, treatise on this. Um, particularly, the importance of the UAE is a stopover for migratory birds, which come from uh, uh, Eurasia down to Africa, for example. Uh, so the Arabian toad, we've got a whole chapter that features the amphibians as well as the reptiles, which are some of the most beautiful pictures that you'll find in the book, for example. And then a chapter by Brigitte Tower, who many of you may know, uh, who works on uh, insects and arthropods like this camel spider. You can see here one of the less pretty pictures in the book. <laughs> Um, uh, other organisms, uh, organismal chapters rather, uh, focus on the marine environment. We've got Eda's chapter on marine mammals uh, with uh, Meta Emily. Um, we have uh, marine reptiles like this uh, sea, snake, sea snake that you can see here. One of Johannes L's took this picture, and I don't know how we managed to get that shot, uh, but pretty amazing. Uh, uh, the rays and the sharks, like the black tip reef shark that you can see here, are covered by uh, Aaron Henderson. And then uh, Matt Mitchell and a few colleagues uh, wrote the chapter that's on fishes, which is not just uh, the beautiful Picasso sugar fish that you see here and uh, other marine fishes, but also freshwater fishes. So we have several species of freshwater fishes living in the waters, as we discussed, discussed earlier. Um, and we close the book with a section that's focused on human interactions with the environment. So this starts with an archaeological perspective on how humans interact with the environment here uh, from the Neolithic until now. And then a chapter that I led with a couple of other colleagues on cities themselves as ecosystems. We, of course, are built in microhabitats that are very attractive to many different organisms. And we've got lots of commensal species that sort of occupy these habitats, but they don't get any attention. So I think you'll find that interesting to read. And finally, a chapter that closes the book that's uh, looking forward, trying to understand what the Emirates might look like in 25 years, at 2050. Um, if we continue on the path that we're on versus taking some relatively drastic action in terms of conservation and management uh, to improve the sustainability of some of the practices that are occurring. Um, and with that, I will close. Um, what I would like to do before I do close is to really give a big props and thanks to Cancun. So they're our government partner uh, in Abu Dhabi. They paid for the open access um, version of this book, which you can access using that QR code that's there if you're technologically literate. Um, otherwise, Google the natural history of the Emirates. Um, and so you can get this book as a PDF, you can read it online as web pages, you can send it to your friends, you can use it in class, it's completely free and open access, and because we made a creative comment, you can use any of the pictures and figures that are in there for any purpose. Um, so you're welcome to use those as resources uh, or educational material. Um, I'd also like to thank Mubala, who funds a lot of the work that I do, um, which helps support uh, the generation of this book, for example, and of course, my employer and one of the And you for being here, and especially those of you at home. Thank you very much. <laughs>
reminded me that we're we're keeping him up beyond his, his normal <laughs> normal bedtime. Uh, we'll uh, I'm sure we'll hang around for a couple of hours, but we'll take a, a let's take three questions from the from the floor. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 And one thing I have noticed in that time is that our summer temperatures, our lower temperatures in summer are higher. And when I was first here in the high summer, 28 degrees, 29 degrees, but now they tend to be in the 30, 30, about 34. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm wondering though, because we've got so much more concrete around us, mm -hmm. and if that is not a factor, if, if we were, if I was in an area that didn't have the concrete jungle, so to speak, yeah. would the temperature be lower, the nighttime temperature? Certainly, it, it, it depends on where you live in particular, but I'm assuming even back then you probably lived near the coast. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have this process that's called the urban heat island effect, which is well known that if you have impervious surfaces like concrete and steel, glass and things like that, they are a trap. And so, and they collect during the daytime and re radiate it at night. And so it's well known around the world that you get pockets of higher heat within cities versus the outside areas. And this is something that's not unique to the UAE, um, but uh, given how extensive some of these cities are here, um, it will be important. But you also have to remember a lot of the cooling effect would have been from things like sea breeze uh, coming in the evening, which now are getting impacted by these buildings over there. So you're not getting as much wind flow. So it's not just the absolute temperature, but probably the perceived temperature because you don't have the winds as much anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because yeah. you wouldn't say Sh shakes like road, all those buildings almost act like a cliff. Yeah, but you also have to recognize like everyone has an air conditioning unit. It may not mean your window, but it's on the top of your building, and that's least heat that's going out on top of the just average heat that's here. Yeah. Examination because the population is increasing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, we've gone from a population of just under 100,000 people in the 1960s to about 10 million today. All of us are reliant on desalinated water for, for consumption. There is some use of groundwater for agricultural purposes, but um, it's largely desal. The, so half of the world's desalination occurs in the Arabian Gulf, these eight nations around a tiny shallow puddle of water. Um, half of that, again, so 25% of the desal capacity in the entire world is just in the Amazon. So we have a lot of desalinated water being produced here in the UAE. Um, I have written one paper with a colleague that looks at the sort of large scale impacts of desalination on the salinity of the Gulf as a whole. We've actually shown that there is no impact on desal uh, desalination on the salinity of the Gulf because what actually happens is uh, with climate change and uh, desalination, it actually increases the circulation of the water in the Gulf, so it's more of it's going up faster to the Indian Ocean. That's not to say on a local scale, it's around the desalination plants themselves, that you're not going to have localized impacts. This is particularly true of functionally two types of uh, desalination that occur here in the UAE. Uh, one is called reverse osmosis, which is to put water through a membrane. That results in kind of saline water for no temperature change. But by far the most common approach that's used here in the UAE, although it's slowly getting smaller and smaller, uh, is flash distillation where you boil the water machine. Uh, and that you send out not only salty water, but it's hot salty water and it's in offset. Um, and so that is clearly going to have at least a localized scale impacts on the marine environment. Whether those extend over scales that are ecologically meaningful is an open question because it's, let's say, challenging to do research in that area, right? <laughs> Last one, yes, sir. Has there been any uh, volcanic activity in the past near the range of the mountains? A uh, very long time ago, but I don't know about how recently. Uh, volcanic activity in the UAE. Not on this side. Yeah. So we are underwater. Some of the, you you will find you will find pillow lavas uh, in the sediments that were pushed ahead of the Ophiolite when it was shoved down, but they were they were uh, going off uh, under sea. Not, nothing on land this side. And uh, on the Iranian side, uh, uh, same thing. There's those all volcanism, but underwater before there's a lot of tectonic activity. So we have minor earthquakes all the time, mainly originating in Iran, but uh, 
while well, integrating two kids doesn't sound like too much fun. Um, for those of you who are interested in a hard copy of the book, like I said, you can pick it up from the Rudy. You can buy it on Amazon.ae. Uh, or I've got some here if you, I don't have change. Uh, so if you have 200 germs and you'd like to walk out the door with one, you're happy to take one. But like I said, it's free. Don't feel like I'm trying to sell these books. I'm <laughs> not. Um, so I just brought them on because I know some people like to have hard copies. And with that, I'll close up for the night. And thank you to those of you who are at home uh, for attending.